Chapter One of Celebrated Crimes, Volume Seven, Part One. Ali Pasha. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Crimes, Volume Seven, Part One. Ali Pasha by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. Chapter One. The beginning of the 19th century was a time of audacious enterprises and strange vicissitudes of fortune. Whilst Western Europe in turn submitted and struggled against the sub-lieutenant who made himself an emperor, who at his pleasure made kings and destroyed kingdoms, the ancient eastern part of the continent, like mummies which preserve but the semblance of life, was gradually tumbling to pieces and getting parcelled out amongst bold adventurers who skirmished over its ruins without mentioning local revolts which produced only short-lived struggles and trifling changes of administration such as that of the jar pasha who refused to pay tribute because he thought himself impregnable in his citadel of st jean d'acre or that of passavant uglu pasha who planted himself on the walls of widden as defender of the janissaries against the institution of the regular militia decreed by sultan selim at stamboul there were wider spread rebellions which attacked the constitution of the turkish empire and diminished its extent amongst them that of Tsarani george which raised servia to the position of a free state of mahomet ali who made his pashalik of egypt into a kingdom and finally that of the man whose history we are about to narrate ali tepelini pasha of yanina whose long resistance to the suzerain power preceded and brought about the regeneration of greece Ali's own will counted for nothing in this important movement. He foresaw it, but without ever seeking to aid it, and was powerless to arrest it. He was not one of those men who placed their lives and services at the disposal of any cause indiscriminately, and his sole aim was to acquire and increase a power of which he was both the guiding influence and the end and object. His nature contained the seeds of every human passion, and he devoted all his long life to their development and gratification this explains his whole temperament his actions were merely the natural outcome of his character confronted with circumstances few men have understood themselves better or been on better terms with the orbit of their existence and as the personality of an individual is all the more striking in proportion as it reflects the manners and ideas of the time and country in which he has lived so the figure of ali pasha stands out if not one of the most brilliant at least one of the most singular in contemporary history. From the middle of the 18th century, Turkey had been a prey to the political gangrene of which she is vainly trying to cure herself today, and which before long will dismember her in the sight of all Europe. Anarchy and disorder reigned from one end of the empire to the other. The Osmanli race, bred on conquest alone, proved good for nothing when conquest failed. It naturally therefore came to pass when Sobieski, who saved Christianity under the walls of Vienna as before his time, Charles Martel had saved it on the plains of Poitiers, had set bounds to the wave of Mussulman westward invasion, and definitely fixed a limit which it should not pass, that the Osmanli warlike instincts recoil upon themselves. The haughty descendants of Ortrogul, who considered themselves born to command, seeing victory forsake them, fell back upon tyranny. Vainly did reason expostulate that oppression could not long be exercised by hands which had lost their strength, and that peace imposed new and different labors on those who no longer triumphed in war. They would listen to nothing, and, as fatalistic when condemned to a state of peace as when they marched forth conquering and to conquer, they cowered down a magnificent listlessness, leaving the whole burden of their support on conquered peoples like ignorant farmers who exhaust fertile fields by forcing crops they rapidly ruined their vast and rich empire by exorbitant exactions inexorable conquerors and insatiable masters with one hand they flogged their slaves and with the other plundered them nothing was superior to their insolence nothing on a level with their greed they were never glutted and never relaxed their exhortions but in proportion as their needs increased on the one hand so did their resources diminish on the other their oppressed subjects soon found that they must escape at any cost from oppressors whom they could neither appease nor satisfy each population took the steps best suited to its position and character some chose inertia others violence 
the inhabitants of the plains powerless and shelterless bent like reeds before the storm and evaded the shock against which they were unable to stand the mountaineers planted themselves like rocks in a torrent and dammed its course with all their might on both sides arose a determined resistance different in method similar in result in the case of the peasants labor came to a standstill in that of the hill folk open war broke out the grasping exactions of the tyrant dominant body produced nothing from wastelands and armed mountaineers destitution and revolt were equally beyond their power to cope with and all that was left for tyranny to govern was a desert enclosed by a wall but all the same the wants of a magnificent sultan descendant of the prophet and distributor of crowns must be supplied and to do this the sublime port needed money unconsciously imitating the roman senate the turkish divan put up the empire for sale by public auction all employments were sold to the highest bidder pashas beys cadis ministers of every rank and clerks of every class had to buy their posts from their sovereign and get the money back out of his subjects they spent their money in the capital and recuperated themselves in the provinces and as there was no other law than their master's pleasure so there was no other guarantee than his caprice they had therefore to set quickly to work the post might be lost before its cost had been recovered thus all the science of administration resolved itself into plundering as much and as quickly as possible to this end the delegate of imperial power delegated in his turn on similar conditions other agents to seize for him and for themselves all they could lay their hands on so that the inhabitants of the empire might be divided into three classes those who were striving to seize everything those who were trying to save a little and those who having nothing and hoping for nothing took no interest in affairs at all albania was one of the most difficult provinces to manage its inhabitants were poor brave and the nature of the country was mountainous and inaccessible the pashas had great difficulty in collecting tribute because the people were given to fighting for their bread whether mahomedans or christians the albanians were above all soldiers descended on the one side from the unconquerable scythians on the other from the ancient macedonians not long since masters of the world crossed with norman adventurers brought eastward by the great movement of the crusades they felt the blood of warriors flow in their veins and that war was their element sometimes at feud with one another canton against canton village against village often even house against house sometimes rebelling against the government their sanjaks sometimes in league with these against the sultan uh, they never rested from combat except in an armed peace each tribe had its military organization each family its fortified stronghold each man his gun on his shoulder when they had nothing better to do they tilled their fields or mowed their neighbors carrying off it should be noted the crop or pastured their flocks watching the opportunity to trespass over pasture limits this was the normal and regular life of the population of epirus thesprotia thessaly and upper albania lower albania less strong was also less active and bold and there as in many other parts of turkey the dalesman was often the prey of the mountaineer it was in the mountain districts where were preserved the recollections of skander beg and where the manners of ancient laconia prevailed the deeds of the brave soldier were sung on the lyre and the skilful robber quoted as an example to the children by the father of the family village feasts were held on the booty taken from strangers and the favorite dish was always a stolen sheep every man was esteemed in proportion to his skill and courage and a man's chances of making a good match were greatly enhanced when he required the reputation of being an agile mountaineer and a good bandit the albanians proudly called this anarchy liberty and religiously guarded a state of disorder bequeathed by their ancestors which always assured the first place to the most valiant it was amidst men and manners such as these that ali tepelini was born he boasted that he belonged to the conquering race and that he descended from an ancient anatolian family which had crossed into albania with the troops of bajazet ilderim but it is made certain by the learned researchers of m de pouqueville that he sprang from a native stock and not an asiatic one as he pretended 
His ancestors were Christian Skipitars, who became Mussulmans after the Turkish invasion, and his ancestry certainly cannot be traced farther back than the end of the 16th century. Mukhtar Tepelini, his grandfather, perished in the Turkish expedition against Corfu in 1716. Marshal Schulenberg, who defended the island, having repulsed the enemy with loss, took Mukhtar prisoner on Mount San Salvador, where he was in charge of a signaling party, and with a barbarity worthy of his adversaries hung him without trial. It must be admitted that the memory of this murder must have had the effect of rendering Ali badly disposed towards Christians. Mukhtar left three sons, two of whom, Salik and Mahomet, were born of the same mother, a lawful wife, but the mother of the youngest, Vali, was a slave. His origin was no legal bar to his succeeding like his brothers. The family was one of the richest in the town of Tepelin, whose name it bore. It enjoyed an income of six thousand piastres, equal to twenty thousand francs. This was a large fortune in a poor country where all commodities were cheap. But the Tepelini family, holding the rank of bays, had to maintain a state like that of the great financiers of feudal Europe. They had to keep a large stud of horses, with a great retinue of servants and men-at-arms, and consequently to incur heavy expenses. Thus they constantly found their revenue inadequate. The most natural means of raising it which occurred to them was to diminish the number of those who shared it. Therefore two elder brothers, sons of the wife, combined against Veli, the son of the slave, and drove him out of the house. The latter, forced to leave home, bore his fate like a brave man, and determined to levy exactions on others to compensate him for the losses incurred through his brothers. He became a freebooter, patrolling high roads and lanes with his gun on his shoulder and his yatagan in his belt, attacking, holding for ransom, or plundering all whom he encountered. After some years of this profitable business, he found himself a wealthy man and chief of a warlike band. Judging that the moment for vengeance had arrived, he marched for Tepelen, which he reached unsuspected, crossed the river Vajutsa, the ancient Aus, penetrated the streets unresisted, and presented himself before the paternal house, in which his brothers, forewarned, had barricaded themselves. He at once besieged them, soon forced the gates, and pursued them to a tent in which they took a final refuge. He surrounded this tent, waited till they were inside it, and then set fire to the four corners. See, said he to those around him, they cannot accuse me of vindictive reprisals. My brothers drove me out of doors, and I retaliate by keeping them at home forever. In a few moments he was his father's sole heir and master of Tepelen. Arrived at the summit of his ambition, he gave up freebooting and established himself in the town of which he became chief ergo. He had already a son by a slave, who soon presented him with another son, and afterwards with a daughter, so that he had no reason to fear dying without an heir. But finding himself rich enough to maintain more wives and bring up many children, he desired to increase his credit by allying himself to some great family of the country. He therefore solicited and obtained the hand of Kamko, the daughter of a bey of Kanitza. This marriage attached him by the ties of relationship to the principal families of the province, among others to Kord Pasha, vizier of Surat, who was descended from the illustrious race of Skander Beg. After a few years, Veli had by his new wife a son named Ali, the subject of this history, and a daughter named Kianitza. In spite of his intentions to reform, Veli could not entirely give up his old habits. Although his fortune placed him altogether above small gains and losses, he continued to amuse himself by raiding from time to time sheep, goats, and other perquisites, probably to keep his hand in. This innocent exercise of his taste was not to the fancy of his neighbors, and brawls and fights recommenced in fine style. Fortune did not always favor him, and the old mountaineer lost in the town part of what he had made on the hills. Vexations soured his temper and injured his health. Notwithstanding the injunctions of Mahomet, he sought consolation in wine, which soon closed his career. He died in 1754. End of chapter 1. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 2 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 
ali thus at thirteen years of age was free to indulge in the impetuosity of his character from his early youth he had manifested a mettle and activity rare in young turks haughty by nature and self-restrained by education scarcely out of the nursery he spent his time in climbing mountains wandering through forests scaling precipices rolling in snow inhaling the wind defying the tempests breathing out his nervous energy through every pore possibly he learnt in the midst of every kind of danger to brave everything and subdue everything possibly in sympathy with the majesty of nature he felt aroused in him a need of personal grandeur which nothing could satiate in vain his father sought to calm his savage temper and restrain his vagabond spirit nothing was of any use as obstinate as intractable he set at defiance all efforts and all precautions if they shut him up he broke the door or jumped out of the window if they threatened him he pretended to comply conquered by fear and promised everything that was required but only to break his word the first opportunity he had a tutor specially attached to his person and charged to supervise all his actions he constantly deluded him by fresh tricks and when he thought himself free from the consequences he maltreated him with gross violence it was only in his youth after his father's death that he became more manageable he even consented to learn to read to please his mother whose idol he was and to whom in return he gave all his affection if kamko had so strong a liking for ali it was because she found in him not only her blood but also her character during the lifetime of her husband whom she feared she seemed only an ordinary woman but as soon as his eyes were closed she gave free scope to the violent passions which agitated her bosom ambitious bold vindictive she assiduously cultivated the germs of ambition hardihood and vengeance which already strongly showed themselves in the young ali my son she was never tired of telling him he who cannot defend his patrimony richly deserves to lose it remember that the property of others is only theirs so long as they are strong enough to keep it and that when you find yourself strong enough to take it from them it is yours success justifies everything and everything is permissible to him who has the power to do it ali when he reached the zenith of his greatness used to declare that his success was entirely his mother's work i owe everything to my mother he said one day to the french consul for my father when he died left me nothing but a den of wild beasts and a few fields my imagination inflamed by the counsels of her who has given me life twice over since she has made me both a man and a vizier revealed to me the secret of my destiny thenceforward i saw nothing in tepelen but the natal air from which i was to spring on the prey which i devoured mentally i dreamt of nothing else but power treasures palaces in short what time has realized and still promises for the point i have now reached is not the limit of my hopes kamko did not confine herself to words she employed every means to increase the fortune of her beloved son and to make him a power her first care was to poison the children of veli's favorite slave who had died before him then at ease about the interior of her family she directed her attention to the exterior renouncing all the habit of her sex she abandoned the veil and the distaff and took up arms under pretext of maintaining the rights of her children she collected round her her husband's old partisans whom she attached to her service some by presents others by various favors and she gradually enlisted all the lawless and adventurous men in tuscaria with their aid she made herself all-powerful in tepelen and inflicted the most rigorous persecutions on such as remained hostile to her but the inhabitants of the two adjacent villages of cormovo and cardiki fearing lest this terrible woman aided by her son now grown into a man should strike a blow against their independence made a secret alliance against her with the object of putting her out of the way the first convenient opportunity learning one day that ali had started on a distant expedition with his best soldiers they surprised tepelen under cover of night and carried off kamko and her daughter kianitza captives to kardiki it was proposed to put them to death and sufficient evidence to justify their execution was not wanting but their beauty saved their lives their captors preferred to revenge themselves by licentiousness rather than by murder 
shut up all day in prison they only emerged at night to pass into the arms of the men who had won them by lot the previous morning this state of things lasted for a month at the end of which a greek of argyro castron named g malakovo moved by compassion for their horrible fate ransomed them for twenty thousand piastres and took them back to tepelen ali had just returned he was accosted by his mother and sister pale with fatigue shame and rage they told him what had taken place with cries and tears and Kamko added fixing her distracted eyes upon him my son my son my soul will enjoy no peace till cormovo and cardicule destroyed by thy scimitar will no longer exist to bear witness to my dishonour ali in whom this sight and this story had aroused sanguinary passions promised a vengeance proportioned to the outrage and worked with all his might to place himself in a position to keep his word a worthy son of his father he had commenced life in the fashion of the heroes of ancient greece stealing sheep and goats and from the age of fourteen years he had acquired an equal reputation to that earned by the son of jupiter and maya when he grew to manhood he extended his operations at the time of which we are speaking he had long practised open pillage his plundering expeditions added to his mother's savings who since her return from Kardiki had altogether withdrawn from public life and devoted herself to household duties, enabled him to collect a considerable force for an expedition against Cormovo, one of the two towns he had sworn to destroy. He marched against it at the head of his banditti, but found himself vigorously opposed, lost part of his force, and was obliged to save himself and the rest by flight. He did not stop till he reached Tepelin, where he had a warm reception from Kamko, whose thirst for vengeance had been disappointed by his defeat. "'Go,' said she, "'go, coward, go spin with the women in the harem. The distaff is a better weapon for you than the scimitar.' The young man answered not a word, but deeply wounded by these reproaches, retired to hide his humiliation in the bosom of his old friend the mountain. The popular legend, always thirsting for the marvellous in the adventures of heroes, has it that he found in the ruins of a church a treasure, which enabled him to reconstitute his party. But he himself has contradicted this story, stating that it was by the ordinary methods of rapine and plunder that he replenished his finances. He selected from his old band of brigands uh, thirty palakars, and entered, as their uh, bulabaji or leader of the group, into the service of the pasha of Negropont but he soon tired of the methodical life he was obliged to lead and passed into thessaly where following the example of his father veli he employed his time in a brigandage on the highways thence he raided the pindus chain of mountains plundered a great number of village and returned to tepelin richer and consequently more esteemed than ever he employed his fortune and influence in collecting a formidable guerrilla force and resumed his plundering operations Kurd Pasha soon found himself compelled by the universal outcry of the province to take active measures against this young brigand. He sent against him a division of troops, which defeated him and brought him prisoner with his men to Barat, the capital of central Albania and residence of the governor. The country flattered itself that at length it was freed from its scourge. The whole body of bandits was condemned to death, but Ali was not the man to surrender his life so easily whilst they were hanging his comrades he threw himself at the feet of the pasha and begged for mercy in the name of his parents excusing himself on account of his youth and promising a lasting reform the pasha seeing at his feet a comely youth with fair hair and blue eyes a persuasive voice and eloquent tongue and in whose veins flowed the same blood as his own was moved with pity and pardoned him ali got off with a mild captivity in the palace of his powerful relative who heaped benefits upon him and did all he could to lead him into the paths of probity he appeared amenable to these good influences and bitterly to repent his past errors after some years believing in his reformation and moved by the prayers of Kamko, who incessantly implored the restitution of her dear son the generous pasha restored him his liberty only giving him to understand that he had no more mercy to expect if he again disturbed the public peace ali taking the threat seriously did not run the risk of braving it and on the contrary did all he could to conciliate the man whose anger he dared not kindle not only did he keep the promise he had made to live quietly but by his good conduct he caused his former escapades to be forgotten 
putting under obligation all his neighbors and attaching to himself through the services he rendered them a great number of friendly disposed persons in this manner he soon assumed a distinguished and honourable rank among the bays of the country and being of marriageable age he sought and formed an alliance with the daughter of capilan tigre pasha of delvino who resided at arguero castran this union happy on both sides gave him with one of the most accomplished women in epirus a high position and great influence it seemed as if this marriage were destined to wean ali for ever from his former turbulent habits and wild adventures but the family into which he had married afforded violent contrasts and equal elements of good and mischief if emina his wife was a model of virtue his father-in-law capelan was a composition of every vice selfish ambitious turbulent fierce confident in his courage and further emboldened by his remoteness from the capital the pasha of delvino gloried in setting law and authority at defiance ali's disposition was too much like that of his father-in-law to prevent him from taking his measure very quickly he soon got on good terms with him and entered into his schemes waiting for an opportunity to denounce him and become his successor for this opportunity he had not long to wait Capelan's object in giving his daughter to Tepelini was to enlist him among the bays of the province to gain independence, the ruling passion of viziers. The cunning young man pretended to enter into the views of his father-in-law and did all he could to urge him into the path of rebellion. An adventurer named Stefano Piccolo, an emissary of Russia, had just raised in Albania the standard of the cross and called to arms all the Christians of the Acroceronian Mountains the divan sent orders to all the pashas of northern turkey and europe to instantly march against the insurgents and quell the rising in blood instead of obeying the orders of the divan and joining kurd pasha who had summoned him capelan at the instigation of his son-in-law did all he could to embarrass the movement of the imperial troops and without openly making common cause with the insurgents he rendered them substantial aid in their resistance they were notwithstanding conquered and dispersed and their chief stefano piccolo had to take refuge in the unexplored caves of montenegro when the struggle was over capelan as ali had foreseen was summoned to give an account of his conduct before the rumuli valisi supreme judge over turkey and europe he was not only accused of the gravest offences but proofs of them were forwarded to the divan by the very man who had instigated them there could be no doubt as the result of the inquiry therefore the pasha who had no suspicions of his son-in-law's duplicity determined not to leave his pashalik that was not in accordance with the plans of ali who wished to succeed to both the government and the wealth of his father-in-law he accordingly made the most plausible remonstrances against the inefficacy and danger of such a resistance to refuse to plead was tantamount to a confession of guilt and was certain to bring on his head a storm against which he was powerless to cope whilst if he obeyed the orders of the rumili valisi he would find it easy to excuse himself to give more effect to his perfidious advice ali further employed the innocent emina who was easily alarmed on her father's account overcome by the reasoning of his son-in-law and the tears of his daughter the unfortunate pasha consented to go to monastere where he had been summoned to appear and where he was immediately arrested and beheaded ali's schemes had succeeded but both his ambition and his cupidity were frustrated ali bey of argiro castron who had throughout shown himself devoted to the sultan was nominated pasha of delvino in place of capelan he sequestered all the property of his predecessor as confiscated to the sultan and thus deprived ali tepelini of all the fruits of his crime this disappointment kindled the wrath of the ambitious ali he swore vengeance for the spoliation of which he considered himself the victim but the moment was not favorable for putting his projects in train the murder of capelan which its perpetrator intended for a mere crime proved a huge blunder the numerous enemies of tepelini silent under the administration of the late pasha whose resentment they had cause to fear soon made common cause under the new one for whose support they had hopes ali saw the danger sought and found the means to obviate it he succeeded in making a match between ali of argiro castron who was unmarried and chenitza his own sister this alliance secured to him the government of tigre which he held under capelan but that was not sufficient 
he must put himself in a state of security against the dangers he had lately experienced and establish himself on a firm footing against possible accidents he soon formed a plan which he himself described to the french consul in the following words years were elapsing said he and brought no important change in my position i was an important partisan it is true and strongly supported but i held no title or government employment of my own i recognized the necessity of establishing myself firmly in my birthplace i had devoted friends and formidable foes bent on my destruction whom i must put out of the way for my own safety i set about a plan for destroying them at one blow and ended by devising one with which i ought to have commenced my career had i done so i should have saved much time and pains i was in the habit of going every day after hunting for a siesta in a neighboring wood a confidential servant of mine suggested to my enemies the idea of surprising me and assassinating one there i myself supplied the plan of the conspiracy which was adopted on the day agreed upon i preceded my adversaries to the place where i was accustomed to repose and caused a goat to be pinioned and muzzled and fastened under the tree covered with my cape i then returned home by a roundabout path soon after i had left the conspirators arrived and fired a volley at the goat <laughs> they ran up to make certain of my death but were interrupted by a piquet of my men who unexpectedly emerged from a copse where i had posted them and they were obliged to return to tepelen which they entered riotous with joy crying Hali bey is dead now we are free this news reached my harem and i heard the cries of my mother and my wife mingled with the shouts of my enemies i allowed the commotion to run its course and reach its height so as to indicate which were my friends and which my foes but when the former were at the depth of their distress and the latter at the height of their joy and exulting in their supposed victory had drowned their prudence and their courage in floods of wine then strong in the justice of my cause i appeared upon the scene now was the time for my friends to triumph and for my foes to tremble i set to work at the head of my partisans and before sunrise had exterminated the last of my enemies i distributed their lands their houses and their goods amongst my followers and from that moment i could call the town of tepelin my own a less ambitious man might perhaps have remained satisfied with such a result but ali did not look upon the suzerainty of a canton as a final object but only as a means to an end and he had not made himself master of tepelin to limit himself to a petty state but to employ it as a base of operations he had allied himself to ali of argiro castron to get rid of his enemies once free from them he began to plot against his supplanter he forgot neither his vindictive projects nor his ambitious schemes as prudent in execution as bold in design he took good care not to openly attack a man stronger than himself and gained by stratagem what he could not obtain by violence the honest and straightforward character of his brother-in-law afforded an easy success to his perfidy he began by endeavouring to suborn his sister chenitza and several times proposed to her to poison her husband but she who dearly loved the pasha who was a kind husband and to whom she had borne two children repulsed his suggestions with horror and threatened if he persisted to denounce him ali fearing the consequences if she carried out her threat begged forgiveness for his wicked plans pretended deep repentance and spoke of his brother-in-law in terms of the warmest affection his acting was so consummate that even chenitza who well knew her brother's subtle character was deceived by it when he saw that she was his dupe knowing that he had nothing more either to fear or to hope for from that side he directed his attention to another the pasha had a brother named soliman whose character nearly resembled that of Tepelini. The latter, after having for some time quietly studied him, thought he discerned in him the man he wanted. He tempted him to kill the pasha, offering him, as the price of his crime, his whole inheritance and in the hand of Kienitsa, only reserving for himself the long-coveted Sanjak. Soliman accepted the proposals, and the fratricidal bargain was concluded. 
the two conspirators, sole masters of the secret, the horrible nature of which guaranteed their mutual fidelity, and having free access to the person of their victim, could not fail in their object. One day, when they were both received by the pasha in private audience, Soliman, taking advantage of a moment when he was unobserved, drew a pistol from his belt and blew out his brother's brains. Kianitsa ran at the sound and saw her husband lying dead between her brother and her brother-in-law. Her cries for help were stopped by threats of death if she moved or uttered a sound. As she lay fainting with grief and terror, Ali made a sign to Soliman, who covered her with his cloak and declared her his wife. Ali pronounced the marriage concluded and retired for it to be consummated. Thus was celebrated this frightful wedding, in the scene of an awful crime, beside the corpse of a man who a moment before had been the husband of the bride and the brother of the bridegroom. The assassins published the death of the pasha, attributing it, as is usual in Turkey, to a fit of cerebral apoplexy. But the truth soon leaked out from the lying shrouds which it had been wrapped, Reports even exceeded the truth, and public opinion implicated Kianitsa in a crime of which she had been but the witness. Appearances certainly justified these suspicions. The young wife had soon consoled herself in the arms of her second husband for the loss of the first, and her son by him presently died suddenly, thus leaving Soliman in lawful and peaceful possession of all his brother's wealth. As for the little girl, as she had no rights and could hurt no one, her life was spared and she was eventually married to a bey of Clesura, destined in the sequel to cut a tragic figure in the history of the Tepelini family. But Ali was once more deprived of the fruit of his bloody schemes. Notwithstanding all his intrigues, the Sanjak of Delvino was conferred not upon him, but upon a bey of one of the first families of Zipporia. But far from being discouraged, he recommenced with new boldness and still greater confidence the work of his elevation, so often begun and so often interrupted. He took advantage of his increasing influence to ingratiate himself with the new pasha, and was so successful in insinuating himself into his confidence that he was received into the palace and treated like the pasha's son. There he acquired complete knowledge of the details of the pasha leak and the affairs of the pasha, preparing himself to govern the one when he had got rid of the other. The Sanjak of Delvino was bounded from Venetian territory by the district of Bathrotum. Selim, a better neighbor and an abler politician than his predecessors, sought to renew and preserve friendly commercial relations with the purveyors of the magnificent republic. This wise conduct, equally advantageous for both the bordering provinces, instead of gaining for the pasha the praise and favors which he deserved, rendered him suspected at a court whose sole political idea was hatred of the name of Christian, and whose sole means of government was terror. Ali immediately perceived the pasha's error and the advantage which he himself could derive from it. Selim, as one of his commercial transactions with the Venetians, had sold them for a number of years the right of felling timber in a forest near Lake Riloda. Ali immediately took advantage of this to denounce the pasha as guilty of having alienated the territory of the sublime port, and of a desire to deliver to the infidels all the province of Delvino. Masking his ambitious designs under the veil of religion and patriotism, he lamented in his denunciatory report the necessity under which he found himself as a loyal subject and faithful Mussulman, of accusing a man who had been his benefactor, and thus at the same time gained the benefit of crime and the credit of virtue. Under the gloomy despotism of the Turks, a man in any position of responsibility is condemned almost as soon as accused and if he is not strong enough to inspire terror, his ruin is certain. Ali received at Tepelen, where he had retired to more conveniently weave his perfidious plots, in order to get rid of the pasha. At the receipt of the firman of execution, he leaped with joy, and flew to Delvino to seize the prey which was abandoned to him. The noble Selim, little suspecting that his protege had become his accuser and was preparing to become his executioner, received him with more tenderness than ever, and lodged him, as heretofore, in his palace. Under the shadow of this hospitable roof, Ali skillfully prepared the consummation of the crime which was forever to draw him out of obscurity. He went every morning to pay his court to the pasha, whose confidence he doubted. Then, one day, feigning illness, he sent excuses for inability to pay his respects to a man whom he was accustomed to regard as his father, and begged him to come for a moment into his apartment. 
the invitation being accepted he concealed assassins in one of the cupboards without shelves so common in the east which contained by day the mattresses spread by night on the floor for the slaves to sleep on at the hour fixed the old man arrived ali rose from his sofa with a depressed air met him kissed the hem of his robe and after seating him in his place himself offered him a pipe and coffee which were accepted but instead of putting the cup in the hand stretched to receive it he let it fall on the floor where it broke into a thousand pieces this was the signal the assassins sprang from their retreat and darted upon selim who fell exclaiming like caesar and it is thou my son who takest my life at the sound of the tumult which followed the assassination selim's bodyguard running up found ali erect covered with blood surrounded by assassins holding in his hand the firman displayed and crying with a menacing voice i have killed the traitor selim by the order of our glorious sultan here is his imperial command at these words and the sight of the fatal diploma all prostrated themselves terror-stricken ali after ordering the decapitation of selim whose head he seized as a trophy ordered the cadi the bays and the greek archons to meet at the palace to prepare the official account of the execution of the sentence they assembled trembling the sacred hymn of the fatahat was sung and the murder declared legal in the name of the merciful and compassionate god lord of the world when they had sealed up the effects of the victim the murderer left the palace taking with him as a hostage mustafa son of selim destined to be even more unfortunate than his father a few days afterwards the divan awarded to ali tepelini as a reward for his zeal for the state and religion the sanjak of thessaly with the title of a dervengi pasha or provost marshal of the roads this latter dignity was conferred on the condition of his levying a body of four thousand men to clear the valley of the penius of a multitude of christian chiefs who exercised more power than the officers of the grand seigneur the new pasha took advantage of this to enlist a numerous body of albanians ready for any enterprise and completely devoted to him with two important commands and with this strong force at his back he repaired to Trikala, the seat of his government where he speedily acquired great influence his first act of authority was to exterminate the bands of armatoles or christian militia which infested the plain he laid violent hands on all whom he caught and drove the rest back into their mountains splitting them up into small bands whom he could deal with at his pleasure at the same time he sent a few heads to constantinople to amuse the sultan and the mob and some money to the ministers to gain their support for said he water sleeps but envy never does these steps were prudent and whilst his credit increased at court order was re-established from the deep defiles of the perebia of pindus to the vale of tempe and to the pass of thermopylae these exploits of the provost marshal amplified by oriental exaggeration justified the ideas which were entertained of the capacity of ali pasha impatient of celebrity he took good care himself to spread his fame relating his prowess to all comers making presents to the sultan's officers who came into his government and showing travellers his palace courtyard festooned with decapitated heads but what chiefly tended to consolidate his power was the treasure which he ceaselessly amassed by every means he never struck for the mere pleasure of striking and the numerous victims of his proscriptions only perished to enrich him his death sentences always fell on bays and wealthy persons whom he wished to plunder in his eyes the axe was but an instrument of fortune and the executioner a tax gatherer end of chapter two recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter three of celebrated crimes volume seven part one ali pasha by alexander dumas translated by george burnham ives this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three having governed thessaly in this manner during several years ali found himself in a position to acquire the province of yanina the possession of which by making him master of epirus would enable him to crush all his enemies and to reign supreme over the three divisions of albania 
but before he could succeed in this it was necessary to dispose of the pasha already in possession fortunately for ali the latter was a weak and indolent man quite incapable of struggling against so formidable a rival and his enemy speedily conceived and put into execution a plan intended to bring about the fulfilment of his desires he came to terms with the same armatolians whom he had formerly treated so harshly and let them loose provided with arms and ammunition on the country which he wished to obtain soon the whole region echoed with stories of devastation and pillage the pasha unable to repel the incursions of these mountaineers employed the few troops he had in oppressing the inhabitants of the plains who groaning under both extortion and rapine vainly filled the air with their despairing cries ali hoped that the divan which usually judged only after the event seeing that epirus lay desolate while thessaly flourished under his own administration would before long entrust himself with the government of both provinces when a family incident occurred which for a time diverted the course of his political manoeuvres for a long time his mother campco had suffered from an internal cancer the result of a life of depravity feeling that her end drew near she dispatched messenger after messenger summoning her son to her bedside he started but arrived too late and found only his sister kenitza mourning over the body of their mother who had expired in her arms an hour previously breathing unutterable rage and pronouncing horrible imprecations against heaven Kamko had commanded her children under pain of her dying curse to carry out her last wishes faithfully after having long given way to their grief ali and kinitza read together the document which contained these commands it ordained some special assassinations mentioned sundry villages which some day were to be given to the flames but ordered them most especially as soon as possible to exterminate the inhabitants of kormovo and kardiki from whom she had endured the last horrors of slavery then after advising her children to remain united to enrich their soldiers and to count as nothing people who were useless to them Kamko ended by commanding them to send in her name a pilgrim to mecca who should deposit an offering on the tomb of the prophet for the repose of her soul having perused these last injunctions ali and kianitza joined hands and over the inanimate remains of their departed mother swore to accomplish her dying behests the pilgrimage came first under consideration now a pilgrim can only be sent as proxy to mecca or offerings be made at the tomb of medina at the expense of legitimately acquired property duly sold for the purpose the brother and sister made a careful examination of the family estates and after long hunting thought they had found the correct thing in a small property of about fifteen hundred franc income inherited from their great-grandfather founder of the tepel Enian dynasty but further investigations disclosed that even this last recourse had been forcibly taken from a christian and the idea of a pious pilgrimage and a sacred offering had to be given up they then agreed to atone for the impossibility of expiation by the grandeur of their vengeance and swore to pursue without ceasing and to destroy without mercy all enemies of their family the best mode of carrying out this terrible and self-given pledge was that ali should resume his plans of aggrandizement exactly where he had left them he succeeded in acquiring the pashalik of yanina which was granted him by the port under the title of arpalik or conquest it was an old custom natural to the warlike habits of the turks to bestow the government provinces or towns affecting to despise the authority of the grand seigneur on whomsoever succeeded in controlling them and Yanina occupied this position. It was principally inhabited by Albanians, who had an enthusiastic admiration for anarchy, dignified by them with the name of liberty, and who thought themselves independent in proportion to the disturbance they succeeded in making. Each lived retired as if in a mountain castle, and only went out in order to participate in the quarrels of his faction in the forum. As for the pashas, they were relegated to the old castle on the lake, and there was no difficulty in obtaining their recall. Consequently, there was a general outcry at the news of Ali Pasha's nomination, and it was unanimously agreed that a man whose character and power were alike dreaded must not be admitted within the walls of Yanina. Ali, not choosing to risk his forces in an open battle with a warlike population, and preferring a slower and safer way to a short and dangerous one, began by pillaging the villages and farms belonging to his most powerful opponents. His tactics succeeded, 
and the very persons who had been foremost in vowing hatred to the son of Campco, and who had sworn most loudly that they would die rather than submit to the tyrant, seeing their property daily ravaged, and impending ruin if hostilities continued, applied themselves to procure peace. Messengers were sent secretly to Ali, offering to admit him into Yanina if he would undertake to respect the lives and property of his new allies. Ali promised whatever they asked, and entered the town by night. His first proceeding was to appear before the Cadi, whom he compelled to register and proclaim his ferments of investiture. In the same year in which he arrived at this dignity, really the desire and object of Ali's whole life, occurred also the death of the Sultan Abdul Hamid, whose two sons, Mustafa and Mahmud, were confined in the old Seraglio. This change of rulers, however, made no difference to Ali. The peaceful Selim, exchanging the prison to which his nephews were now relegated for the throne of their father, confirmed the pasha of Yanina in the titles, offices, and privileges which had been conferred on him. Establishing in his position by this double investiture, Ali applied himself to the definite settlement of his claims. He was now fifty years of age and was at the height of his intellectual development. Experience had been his teacher, and the lesson of no single event had been lost upon him. An uncultivated but just and penetrating mind enabled him to comprehend facts, analyze causes, and anticipate results, and as his heart never interfered with the deductions of his rough intelligence, he had by a sort of logical sequence formulated an inflexible plan of action. This man, wholly ignorant not only of the ideas of history but also of the great names of Europe, had succeeded in divining, and as a natural consequence of his active and practical character, in also realizing Machiavelli, as is amply shown in the expansion of his greatness and the exercise of his power. Without faith in God, despising men, loving and thinking only of himself, distrusting all around him, audacious in design, immovable in resolution, inexorable in execution, merciless in vengeance, by turns insolent, humble, violent, or supple according to circumstances, always and entirely logical in his egotism he is caesar borgia reborn as a mussulman he is the incarnate ideal of florentine policy the italian prince converted into a satrap age had as yet in no way impaired ali's strength and activity and nothing prevented his profiting by the advantages of his position already possessing great riches which every day saw increasing under his management he maintained a large body of warlike and devoted troops. He united the offices of Pasha of two tales, of Yanina, of Topark of Thessaly, and of Provost Marshal of the Highway. As influential aids both to his reputation for general ability and the terror of his arms, and his authority as ruler, there stood by his side two sons, Mukhtar and Veli, offspring of his wife Emina, both fully grown and carefully educated in the principles of their father. Ali's first care, once master of Yanina, was to annihilate the bays, forming the aristocracy of the place whose hatred he was well aware of, and whose plots he dreaded. He ruined them all, banishing many and putting others to death, knowing that he must make friends to supply the vacancy caused by the destruction of his foes, he enriched with the spoil the Albanian mountaineers in his pay, known by the name of Skipitars, on whom he conferred most of the vacant employments but much too prudent to allow all the power to fall into the hands of a single caste although a foreign one to the capital he by singular innovation added to and mixed with them an infusion of orthodox greeks a skilful but despised race whose talents he could use without having to dread their influence while thus endeavouring on one side to destroy the power of his enemies by depriving them of both authority and wealth and on the other to consolidate his own by establishing a firm administration, he neglected no means of acquiring popularity. A fervent disciple of Mahomet when among fanatic Mussulmans, a materialist with the Bektagis who professed a rude pantheism, a Christian among the Greeks with whom he drank to the health of the Holy Virgin, he made everywhere partisans by flattering the idea most in vogue, but if he constantly changed both opinions and language when dealing with subordinates whom it was desirable to win over, Ali, towards his superiors, had one only line of conduct which he never transgressed, obsequious towards the sublime port, so long as it did not interfere with his private authority, he not only paid with exactitude all dues to the sultan to whom he even offered advanced money, 
but he also pensioned the most influential ministers. He was bent on having no enemies who could really injure his power, and he knew that in an absolute government no conviction can hold its own against the power of gold. Having thus annihilated the nobles, deceived the multitude with plausible words, and lulled to sleep the watchfulness of the divan, Ali resolved to turn his arms against Cormovo. At the foot of its rocks he had in youth experienced the disgrace of defeat, and during thirty nights Kamko and Kianitsa had endured all horrors of outrage at the hands of its warriors. Thus the implacable Pasha had a twofold wrong to punish, a double vengeance to exact. This time, profiting by experience, he called in the aid of treachery. Arrived at the citadel, he negotiated, promised an amnesty, forgiveness for all, actual rewards for some. The inhabitants, only too happy to make peace with so formidable an adversary, demanded and obtained a truce to settle the conditions. This was exactly what Ali expected, and Kormovo, sleeping on the faith of the treaty, was suddenly attacked and taken. All who did not escape by flight perished by the sword in the darkness, or by the hand of the executioner the next morning. Those who had offered violence aforetime to Ali's mother and sister were carefully sought for, and whether convicted or merely accused were impaled on spits, torn with red-hot pincers, and slowly roasted between two fires. The women were shaved and publicly scourged and then sold as slaves. This vengeance, in which all the nobles of the province had not yet entirely ruined, were compelled to assist, was worth a decisive victory to Ali. Towns, cantons, whole districts, overwhelmed with terror, submitted without striking a blow, and his name joined to the recital of a massacre which ranked as a glorious exploit in the eyes of this savage people, echoed like thunder from valley to valley and mountain to mountain. In order that all surrounding him might participate in the joy of his success, Ali gave his army a splendid festival. Of unrivaled activity, and Mohammedan only in name, he himself led the chorus in the Pyrrhic and Cleftic dances, the ceremonials of warriors and of robbers. There was no lack of wine, of sheep, goats, and lambs roasted before enormous fires, made of the debris of the ruined city. Antique games of archery and wrestling were celebrated, and the victors received their prizes from the hand of their chief. The plunder, slaves, and cattle were then shared, and the Tapake, considered as the lowest of the four tribes composing the race of Skipatars, and ranking as the refuse of the army, carried off into the mountains of Acroceronia, doors, windows, nails, and even the tiles of the houses, which were then all surrendered to the flames. However, Ibrahim, the successor and son-in-law of Kurd Pasha, could not see with indifference part of his province invaded by his ambitious neighbor. He complained and negotiated, but, obtaining no satisfaction, called out an army composed of skipatars of Toxid, all Islamites, and gave the command to his brother Sefer Bey of Avlone. Ali, who had adopted the policy of opposing alternately the cross to the crescent and the crescent to the cross, summoned to his aid the Christian chiefs of the mountains, who descended into the plains at the head of their unconquered troops. As is generally the case in Albania, where war is merely an excuse for brigandage, instead of deciding matters by a pitched battle, both sides contented themselves with burning villages, hanging peasants, and carrying off cattle. Also in accordance with the custom of the country, the women interposed between the combatants, and the good and gentle Emina laid proposals of peace before Ibrahim Pasha, to whose apathetic disposition a state of war was disagreeable, and who was only too happy to conclude a fairly satisfactory negotiation. A family alliance was arranged, in virtue of which Ali retained his conquests, which were considered as the marriage portion of Ibrahim's eldest daughter, who became the wife of Ali's eldest son, Mukhtar. It was hoped that this peace might prove permanent, but the marriage which sealed the treaty was barely concluded before a fresh quarrel broke out between the pashas. Ali, having wrung such important concessions from the weakness of his neighbor, desired to obtain yet more. But closely allied to Ibrahim were two persons gifted with great firmness of character and unusual ability, whose position gave them great influence. They were his wife, Zaidi, and his brother, Sefer who had been in command during the war just terminated. As both were inimical to Ali, who could not hope to corrupt them, the latter resolved to get rid of them. Having in the days of his youth been intimate with Kurd Pasha, Ali had endeavored to seduce his daughter, already the wife of Ibrahim. 
being discovered by the latter in the act of scaling the wall of his harem he had been obliged to fly the country wishing now to ruin the woman whom he had formerly tried to corrupt ali sought to turn his former crime to the success of a new one anonymous letters secretly sent to ibrahim warned him that his wife intended to poison him in order to be able later to marry ali pasha whom she had always loved in a country like turkey where to suspect a woman is to accuse her and accusation is synonymous with condemnation such a calumny might easily cause the death of the innocent zaidi but if ibrahim was weak and indolent he was also confiding and generous he took the letters to his wife who had no difficulty in clearing herself and who warned him against the writer whose object and plots she easily divined so that his odious conspiracy turned only to ali's discredit but the latter was not likely either to concern himself as to what others said or thought about him or to be disconcerted by a failure he simply turned his machinations against his other enemy and arranged matters this time so as to avoid a failure he sent to zagori a district noted for its doctors for a quack who undertook to poison sefer bey on condition of receiving forty purses when all was settled the miscreant set out for berat and was immediately accused by ali of evasion and his wife and children were arrested as accomplices and detained apparently as hostages for the good behavior of their husband and father but really as pledges for his silence when the crime should have been accomplished sefer bey informed of this by letters which ali wrote to the pasha of berat demanding the fugitive thought that a man persecuted by his enemy would be faithful to himself and took the supposed runaway into his service the traitor made skilful use of the kindness of his too credulous protector insinuated himself into his confidence became his trusted physician and apothecary and gave him poison instead of medicine on the very first appearance of indisposition as soon as symptoms of death appeared the poisoner fled aided by the emissaries of ali with whom the court of berat was packed and presented himself at yanina to receive the reward of his crime ali thanked him for his zeal commended his skill and referred him to the treasurer but the instant the wretch left the seraglio in order to receive his recompense he was seized by the executioners and hurried to the gallows in thus punishing the assassin ali at one blow discharged the debt he owed him disposed of the single witness to be dreaded and displayed his own friendship for the victim not content with this he endeavored to again throw suspicion on the wife of ibrahim pasha whom he accused of being jealous of the influence which sefer pasha had exercised in the family this he mentioned regularly in conversation writing in the same style to his agents in constantinople and everywhere where there was any profit in slandering a family whose ruin he desired for the sake of their possessions before long he made a pretext out of the scandal started by himself and prepared to take up arms in order he said to avenge his friend sefer bey when he was anticipated by ibrahim pasha who rose against him the allied christians of thesprotia foremost among whom ranked the suliots famed through albania for their courage and their love of independence after several battles in which his enemies had a vantage ali began negotiations with ibrahim and finally concluded a treaty offensive and defensive this fresh alliance was like the first to be cemented by a marriage the virtuous emina seeing her son veli united to the second daughter of ibrahim trusted that the feud between the two families was now quenched and thought herself at the summit of happiness but her joy was not of long duration the death groan was again to be heard amidst the songs of the marriage feast the daughter of kinitza by her first husband ali had married a certain murad the bey of clarissora the nobleman attached to ibrahim pasha by both blood and affection since the death of sefer bey had become the special object of ali's hatred caused by the devotion of murat to his patron over whom he had great influence and from whom nothing could detach him skilful in concealing truth under special pretexts ali gave out that the cause of his known dislike to this young man was that the latter although his nephew by marriage had several times fought in hostile ranks against him therefore the amiable ibrahim made use of the marriage treaty to arrange an honorable reconciliation between murad bey and his uncle and appointed the former ruler at the marriage feast in which capacity he was charged to conduct the bride to yanina and deliver her to her husband the young veli bey he had accomplished this mission satisfactorily 
and was received by ali with all apparent hospitality the festival began on his arrival towards the end of november seventeen ninety one and had already continued several days when suddenly it was announced that a shot had been fired upon ali who had only escaped by a miracle and that the assassin was still at large this news spread terror through the city and the palace and every one dreaded being seized as the guilty person spies were everywhere employed but they declared search was useless and that there must have been extensive conspiracy against ali's life the latter complained of being surrounded by enemies and announced that henceforth he would receive only one person at a time who should lay down his arms before entering the hall now set apart for public audience it was a chamber built over a vault and entered by a sort of trap-door only reached by a ladder after having for several days received his couriers in this sort of a difficult, ali summoned his nephew in order to entrust with him the wedding gifts mirad took this as a sign of favor and joyfully acknowledged the congratulations of his friends he presented himself at the time arranged the guards at the foot of the ladder demanded his arms which he gave up readily and ascended the ladder full of hope scarcely had the trap-door closed behind him when a pistol-ball fired from a dark corner broke his shoulder-blade and he fell but sprang up and attempted to fly ali issued from his hiding-place and sprang upon him but notwithstanding his wound the young bey defended himself vigorously uttering terrible cries the pasha eager to finish and finding his hands insufficient caught a burning log from the hearth struck his nephew in the face with it felled him to the ground and completed his bloody task this accomplished ali called for help with loud cries and when his guards entered he showed the bruises he had received and the blood with which he was covered declaring that he had killed in self-defence a villain who endeavoured to assassinate him he ordered the body to be searched and a letter was found in a pocket which ali had himself just placed there which purported to give the details of the pretended conspiracy as mirad's brother was seriously compromised by this letter he also was immediately seized and strangled without any pretense of trial the whole palace rejoiced thanks were rendered to heaven by one of those sacrifices of animals still occasionally made in the east to celebrate an escape from great danger and ali released some prisoners in order to show his gratitude to providence for having protected him from so horrible a crime he received congratulatory visits and composed an apology attested by a judicial declaration by the cadi in which the memory of Murat and his brother was declared accursed. Finally, commissioners, escorted by a strong body of soldiers, were sent to seize the property of the two brothers because, said the decree, it was just that the injured should inherit the possessions of his would-be assassins. Thus was exterminated the only family capable of opposing the Pasha of Yanina, or which could counterbalance his influence over the weak Ibrahim of Barat, the latter abandoned his by his brave defenders and finding himself at the mercy of his enemy was compelled to submit to what he could not prevent and protested only by tears against these crimes which seemed to herald a terrible future for himself as for emina it is said that from the date of this catastrophe she separated herself almost entirely from her blood-stained husband and spent her life in the recesses of the harem praying as a christian both for the murderer and his victims it is a relief in the midst of this atrocious saturnalia to encounter this noble and gentle character which like a desert oasis affords a rest to eyes wearied with the contemplation of so much wickedness and treachery ali lost in her the guardian angel who alone could in any way restrain his violent passions grieved at first by the withdrawal of the wife whom hitherto he had loved exclusively he endeavoured in vain to regain her affection, and then sought in Nuvice's compensation for the happiness he had lost, and gave himself up to sensuality. Ardent in everything, he carried debauchery to a monstrous extent, and as if his palaces were not large enough for his desires, he assumed various disguises, sometimes in order to traverse the streets by night in search of the lowest pleasures, sometimes penetrating by day into churches and private houses seeking for young men and maidens remarkable for their beauty who were then carried off to his harem his sons following in his footsteps kept also scandalous households and seemed to dispute preeminence in evil with their father each in his own manner drunkenness was the specialty of the eldest mukhtar who was without rival among the hard drinkers of albania and who was reputed to have emptied a whole wine-skin in one evening after a plentiful meal 
gifted with the hereditary violence of his family he had in his drunken fury slain several persons among others his sword-bearer the companion of his childhood and confidential friend of his whole life veli chose a different course realizing the marquis de sade as his father had realized machiavelli he delighted in mingling together debauchery and cruelty and his amusement consisted in biting the lips he had kissed and tearing with his nails the forms he had caressed the people of Yanina saw with horror more than one woman in their midst whose nose and ears he had caused to be cut off, and had then turned into the streets. It was indeed a reign of terror. Neither fortune, life, honor, nor family were safe. Mothers cursed their fruitfulness, and women their beauty. Fear soon engenders corruption, and subjects are speedily tainted by the depravity of their masters. Ali, considering a demoralized race as easier to govern, looked on with satisfaction while he strengthened by every means his authority from within he missed no opportunity of extending his rule without in eighteen o three he declared war against the suliots whose independence he had frequently endeavored either to purchase or to overthrow the army sent against them although ten thousand strong was at first beaten everywhere ali then as usual brought treason to his aid and regained the advantage it became evident that sooner or later the unhappy Suliots must succumb. Foreseeing the horrors which their defeat would entail, Emina, touched with compassion, issued from her seclusion and cast herself at Ali's feet. He raised her, seated her beside him, and inquired as to her wishes. She spoke of generosity, of mercy. He listened as if touched and wavering, until she named the Suliots. Then, filled with fury, he seized a pistol and fired at her. She was not hurt, but fell to the ground overcome with terror, and her women hastily intervened and carried her away. For the first time in his life, perhaps, Ali shuddered before the dread of a murder. It was his wife, the mother of his children, whom he saw lying at his feet, and the recollection afflicted and tormented him. He rose in the night and went to Emina's apartment. He knocked and called, but being refused admittance, in his anger he broke open the door terrified by the noise and at the sight of her infuriated husband emina fell into violent convulsions and shortly expired thus perished the daughter of capilan pasha wife of ali tepelini and mother of mukhtar and veli who doomed to live surrounded by evil yet remained virtuous and good her death caused universal mourning throughout albania and produced a not less deep impression on the mind of her murderer Emina's spectre pursued him in his pleasures, in the council chamber, in the hours of night. He saw her, he heard her, and would awake, exclaiming, "'My wife! My wife! It is my wife! Her eyes are angry! She threatens me! Save me! Mercy!' For more than ten years, Ali never dared to sleep alone. End of chapter 3 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 4 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 In December the Suliots, decimated by battle, worn by famine, discouraged by treachery, were obliged to capitulate. The treaty gave them leave to go where they would, their own mountains excepted. The unfortunate tribe divided into two parts, the one going towards Parga, the other towards Prevesa. Ali gave orders for the destruction of both, notwithstanding the treaty. The Parga division was attacked in its march and charged by a numerous body of Skipitars. Its destruction seemed imminent, but instinct suddenly revealed to the ignorant mountaineers the one maneuver which might save them. They formed a square, placing old men, women, children, and cattle in the midst, and protected by this military formation, entered Parga in full view of the cutthroats sent to pursue them. Less fortunate was the Prevesa division, which, terrified by a sudden and unexpected attack, fled in disorder to a Greek convent called Zalangos. But the gate was soon broken down, and the unhappy Suliots massacred to the last man. The women, whose tents had been pitched on the summit of a lofty rock, beheld a terrible carnage which destroyed their defenders, Henceforth, their only prospect was that of becoming the slaves of those who had just slaughtered their husbands and brothers. An heroic resolution spared them this infamy. They joined hands 
and chanting their national songs, moved in a solemn dance round the rocky platform. As the song ended, they uttered a prolonged and piercing cry, and cast themselves and their children down into the profound abyss beneath. There were still some Suliots left in their country when Ali Pasha took possession of it. These were all taken and brought to Yanina, and their sufferings were the first adornments of the festival made for the army. Every soldier's imagination was racked for the discovery of new tortures, and the most original among them had the privilege of themselves carrying out their inventions. There were some who, having had their noses and ears cut off, were compelled to eat them raw, dressed as a salad. One young man was scalped until the skin fell back upon his shoulders, then beaten round the court of the Seraglio for the pasha's entertainment, until at length a lance was run through his body and he was cast on the funeral pile. Many were boiled alive, and their flesh then thrown out to the dogs. From this time the cross has disappeared from the Celiad Mountains, and the gentle prayer of Christ no longer wakes the echoes of Suli. During the course of this war, and shortly after the death of Emina, another dismal drama was enacted in the Pasha's family, whose active wickedness nothing seemed to weary. The scandalous libertinism of both the father and sons had corrupted all around as well as themselves. This demoralization brought bitter fruits for all alike. The subjects endured a terrible tyranny. The masters sowed among themselves distrust, discord, and hatred. The father wounded his two sons by turns in their tenderest affections, and the sons avenged themselves by abandoning their father in the hour of danger. There was in Yanina a woman named Euphresini, a niece of the archbishop married to one of the richest Greek merchants and noted for wit and beauty. She was already the mother of two children when Mukhtar became enamoured of her and ordered her to come to his palace. The unhappy Euphrosyne, at once guessing his object, summoned a family council to decide what should be done. All agreed that there was no escape, and that her husband's life was in danger on account of the jealousy of his terrible rival. He fled the city that same night, and his wife surrendered herself to Mukhtar, who, softened by her charms, soon sincerely loved her, and overwhelmed her with presents and favors. Things were in this position when Mukhtar was obliged to depart on an important expedition. Scarcely had he started before his wives complained to Ali that Euphrosyne usurped their rights and caused their husband to neglect them. Ali, who complained greatly of his son's extravagance and regretted the money they squandered, at once struck a blow which was both to enrich himself and increase the terror of his name. One night he appeared by torchlight, accompanied by his guards at Euphrosyne's house. Knowing his cruelty and avarice, she sought to disarm one by gratifying the other. She collected her money and jewels and laid them at Ali's feet with a look of supplication. "'These are only my own property which you restore,' said he, taking possession of the rich offering. "'Can you give back the heart of Mukhtar, which you have stolen?' Euphrosyne besought him by his paternal feelings, for the sake of his son, whose love had been her misfortune, and was now her only crime, to spare a mother whose conduct had been otherwise irreproachable. But her tears and pleadings produced no effect on Ali, who ordered her to be taken, loaded with fetters, and covered with a piece of sackcloth to the prison of the Seraglio. If it were certain that there was no hope for the unhappy Euphrosyne, one trusted that she might at least be the only victim. But Ali, professing to follow the advice of some severe reformers who wished to restore decent morality, arrested at the same time fifteen ladies belonging to the best Christian families in Yanina. A Wallachian named Nicholas Janko took the opportunity to denounce his own wife, who was on the point of becoming a mother, as guilty of adultery, and handed her also over to the pasha. These unfortunate women were brought before Ali to undergo a trial of which a sentence of death was the foregone conclusion. They were then confined in a dungeon where they spent two days of misery. The third night, the executioners appeared to conduct them to the lake where they were to perish. Euphrosyne, too exhausted to endure to the end, expired by the way, and when she was flung with the rest into the dark waters, her soul had already escaped from its earthly tenement. Her body was found the next day and was buried in the cemetery of the monastery of St. Anargiers, where her tomb, covered with white iris and sheltered by a wild olive tree, is yet shown. Mukhtar was returning from his expedition when a courier from his brother, Veli, brought him a letter informing him of these events. He opened it. Euphrosyne, 
he cried, and seizing one of his pistols, fired it at the messenger who fell dead at his feet. Euphrosyne, behold thy first victim! Springing on his horse, he galloped toward Janina. His guards followed at a distance, and the inhabitants of all the villages he passed fled at this approach. He paid no attention to them, but rode till his horse fell dead by the lake which had engulfed Euphrosyne, and then taking a boat, he went to hide his grief and rage in his own palace. Ali, carrying little for passion which evaporated in tears and cries, sent an order to Mukhtar to appear before him at once. "'He will not kill you,' he remarked to his messenger, with a bitter smile. And in fact, the man who a moment before was furiously raging and storming against his father, as if overwhelmed by this imperious message, calmed down and obeyed. "'Come hither, Mukhtar,' said the pasha, extending his murderous hand to be kissed as soon as his son appeared. "'I shall take no notice of your anger, but in future never forget that a man who braves public opinion as I do fears nothing in the world. You can go now, but when your troops have rested from their march, you can come and ask for orders. Go, remember what I have said.' Mukhtar retired as submissively as if he had just received pardon for some serious crime, and found no better consolation than to spend the night with Veli in drinking and debauchery. But a day was to come when the brothers, alike outraged by their father, would plot and carry out a terrible vengeance. However, the port began to take umbrage at the continual aggrandizement of the Pasha of Yanina. Not daring openly to attack so formidable a vassal, the sultan sought by underhand means to diminish his power, and under the pretext that Ali was becoming too old for the labor of so many offices, the government of Thessaly was withdrawn from him. But to show that this was not done in enmity, the province was entrusted to his nephew, Elmas Bey, son of Suleiman and Kianitza. Kianitza, fully as ambitious as her brother, could not contain her delight at the idea of governing in the name of her son who was weak and gentle in character and accustomed to obey her implicitly. She asked her brother's permission to go to Tricala to be present at the installation, and obtained it to everybody's astonishment, for no one could imagine that Ali would peacefully renounce so important a government as that of Thessaly. However, he dissembled so skillfully that everyone was deceived by his apparent resignation and applauded his magnanimity when he provided his sister with a brilliant escort to conduct her to the capital of the province of which he had just been deprived in favor of his nephew. He sent letters of congratulation to the latter as well as magnificent presents, among them a splendid pelisse of black fox, which had cost more than a hundred thousand francs of western money. He requested Elmas Bey to honor him by wearing this robe on the day when the sultan's envoy should present him with the firman of investiture, and Kianitza herself was charged to deliver both gifts and messages. Kianitza arrived safely at Trakala, and faithfully delivered the messages with which she had been entrusted. When the ceremony she so ardently desired took place, she herself took charge of all the arrangements. Elmas, wearing the black fox pelisse, was proclaimed and acknowledged as governor of Thessaly in her presence. "'My son is Pasha!' she cried in the delirium of joy. "'My son is Pasha, and my nephews will die of envy!' But her triumph was not to be of long duration. A few days after his installation, Elmas began to feel strangely languid. Continual lethargy, convulsive sneezing, feverish eyes, soon betokened a serious illness. Ali's gift had accomplished its purpose. The police, carefully impregnated with smallpox germs taken from a young girl suffering from this malady, had conveyed the dreaded disease to the new pasha, who, not having been inoculated, died in a few days. The grief of Kianitza at her son's death displayed itself in sobs, threats, and curses, but not knowing whom to blame for her misfortune, she hastened to leave the scene of it, and returned to Yanina to mingle her tears with those of her brother. She found Ali apparently in such depths of grief, that instead of suspecting, she was actually tempted to pity him, and this seeming sympathy soothed her distress, aided by the caresses of her second son, Aden Bey. Ali, thoughtful of his own interests, took care to send one of his own officers to Tricala to administer justice in the palace of his deceased nephew, and the port, seeing that all attempts against him only caused misfortune, consented to his resuming the government of Thessaly. 
This climax roused the suspicions of many persons. But the public voice, already discussing the causes of the death of Elenas, was stifled by the thunder of the cannon, which, from the ramparts of Yanina, announced to Epirus the birth of another son to Ali, Salik Bey, whose mother was a Georgian slave. Fortune, seemingly always ready both to crown Ali's crimes with success and to fulfill his wishes, had yet in reserve a more precious gift than any of the others, that of a good and beautiful wife who should replace and even efface the memory of the beloved Emina. The port, while sending to Ali the firman which restored to him the government of Thessaly, ordered him to seek out and destroy a society of coiners who dwelt within his jurisdiction. Ali, delighted to prove his zeal by a service which cost nothing but bloodshed, at once set his spies to work, and having discovered the abode of the gang, set out for the place attended by a strong escort. It was a village called Plikovitsa. Having arranged in the evening, he spent the night in taking measures to prevent escape, and at the break of day attacked the village suddenly with his whole force. The coiners were seized in the act. Ali immediately ordered the chief to be hung at his own door and the whole population to be massacred. Suddenly a young girl of great beauty made her way through the tumult and sought refuge at his feet. Ali, astonished, asked who she was. She answered with a look of mingled innocence and terror, kissing his hands, which she bathed with tears, and said, "'Oh, my lord, I implore thee to intercede with the terrible vizier, Ali, for my mother and brothers.' my father is dead behold where he hangs at the door of our cottage but we have done nothing to rouse the anger of our dreadful master my mother is a poor woman who never offended any one and we are only weak children save us from him touched in spite of himself the pasha took the girl in his arms and answered her with a gentle smile thou hast come to the wrong man child i am this terrible vizier oh no no you you are good you will be our good lord well be comforted my child and show me thy mother and thy brothers they shall be spared thou hast saved their lives and as she knelt at his feet overcome with joy he raised her and asked her name basilessa she replied basilessa queen it is a name of good augury. Basilessa, thou shalt dwell with me henceforth. And he collected the members of her family and gave orders for them to be sent to Yanina in company with the maiden who repaid his mercy with boundless love and devotion. Let us mention one trait of gratitude shown by Ali at the end of this expedition, and his record of good deeds is then closed. Compelled by a storm to take refuge in a miserable hamlet, he inquired its name, and on hearing it appeared surprised and thoughtful, as if trying to recall lost memories. Suddenly asked if a woman named Nutza dwelt within the village, and was told there was an old infirm woman of that name in great poverty. He ordered her to be brought before him. She came and prostrated herself in terror. Ali raised her kindly. "'Dost thou not know me?' he asked. "'Have mercy, great vizier.' answered the poor woman, who, having nothing to lose but her life, imagined that even that would be taken from her. "'I see,' said the pasha, "'that if thou knowest me, thou dost not really recognize me.' The woman looked at him wonderingly, not understanding his words in the least. "'Dost thou remember,' continued Ali, "'that forty years ago, a young man asked for shelter from the foes who pursued him without inquiring his name or standing thou didst hide him in thy humble house and dressed his wounds and shared thy scanty food with him and when he was able to go forward thou didst stand on thy threshold to wish him good luck and success thy wishes were heard for the young man was ali tepelini and i who speak am he the old woman stood overwhelmed with astonishment. She departed, calling down blessings on the pasha, who assured her a pension of fifteen hundred franc for the rest of her days. But these two good actions are only flashes of light illuminating the dark horizon of Ali's life for a brief moment. Returned to Yanina, he resumed his tyranny, his intrigues, and cruelty. 
not content with the vast territory which owned his sway he again invaded that of his neighbors on every pretext focus metolia acarnania were by turns occupied by his troops the country ravaged and the inhabitants decimated at the same time he compelled ibrahim pasha to surrender his last remaining daughter and give her in marriage to his nephew aden bey the son of kianitza this new alliance with a family he had so often attacked and despoiled gave him fresh arms against it whether by being enabled better to watch the pasha's sons or to entice them into some snare with greater ease whilst he thus married his nephew he did not neglect the advancement of his sons by the aid of the french ambassador whom he had convinced of his devotion to the emperor napoleon he succeeded in getting the pashalik of moria bestowed on veli and that of lepanto on mukhtar but as in placing his sons in these exalted positions his only aim was to aggrandize and consolidate his own power he himself ordered their retinues giving them officers of his own choosing when they departed to their governments he kept their wives their children and even their furniture as pledges saying that they ought not to be encumbered with domestic establishments in times of war turkey just then being at open war with england he also made use of this opportunity to get rid of people who displeased him among others of a certain ismail pacho bey of who had been alternately both tool and enemy whom he made secretly to his son veli professedly as a pledge of reconciliation and favor but really in order to despoil him more easily of the considerable property which he possessed at yanina pacho was not deceived and showed his resentment openly the wretch banishes me he cried pointing out ali who was sitting at a window in the palace he sends me away in order to rob me but i will avenge myself whatever happens and i shall die content if i can procure his destruction at the price of my own continually increasing his power ali endeavored to consolidate it permanently he had entered by degrees into secret negotiations with all the great powers of europe hoping in the end to make himself independent and to obtain recognition as prince of greece a mysterious and unforeseen incident betrayed this to the port and furnished actual proofs of his treason in letters confirmed by ali's own seal the sultan selim immediately sent to yanina a, a kapiji bachi or a plenipotentiary to examine into the case and try the delinquent arrived at yanina this officer placed before ali the proofs of his understanding with the enemies of the state ali was not strong enough to throw off the mask and yet could not deny such overwhelming evidence he determined to obtain time no wonder said he that i appear guilty in the eyes of his highness this seal is certainly mine i cannot deny it but the writing is not that of my secretaries and the seal must have been obtained and used to sign these guilty letters in order to ruin me i pray you grant me a few days in order to clear up this iniquitous mystery which compromises me in the eyes of my master the sultan and of all good mahomedans may allah grant me the means of proving my innocence which is as pure as the rays of the sun although everything seems against me after this conference ali pretending to be engaged in a secret inquiry considered how he could legally escape from this predicament he spent some days in making plans which were given up as soon as formed until his fertile genius at length suggested a means of getting clear of one of the greatest difficulties in which he had ever found himself sending for a greek whom he had often employed he addressed him thus thou knowest i have always shown thee favor and the day is arrived when thy fortune shall be made henceforth thou shalt be as my son thy children shall be as mine my house shall be thy home and in return for my benefits i require one small service this accursed kabiji bachi has come hither bringing certain papers signed with my seal intending to use them to my discredit and thus to extort money from me of money i have already given too much and i intend this time to escape without being plundered except for the sake of a good servant like thee therefore my son thou shalt go before the tribunal when i tell thee and declare before this kabiji bachi and the kadi that thou hast written these letters attributed to me and that thou didst seal them with my seal in order to give them due weight 
and importance. The unhappy Greek grew pale and strove to answer. What fearest thou, my son? resumed Ali. Speak, am I not thy good master? Thou wilt be sure of my lasting favor. And who is there to dread when I protect thee? Is it the Kapiji Baji? He is no authority here. I have thrown twenty as good as he into the lake. If more is required to reassure thee, I swear by the prophet, by my own and my son's heads, that no harm shall come to thee from him. Be ready, then, to do as I tell thee, and beware of mentioning this matter to any one, in order that all may be accomplished according to our mutual wishes. More terrified by dread of the pasha, from whose wrath in case of refusal there was no chance of escape, than tempted by his promises, the Greek undertook the false swearing required. Ali, delighted, dismissed him with a thousand assurances of protection, and then requested the presence of the sultan's envoy, to whom he said, with much emotion, "'I have at length unraveled the infernal plot laid against me. It is the work of a man in the pay of the implacable enemies of the sublime port, and who is a Russian agent. He is in my power, and I have given him hopes of pardon on condition of full confession. Will you then summon the cadi?' the judges and ecclesiastics of the town, in order that they may hear the guilty man's deposition, and that the light of truth may purify their minds. The tribunal was soon assembled, and the trembling Greek appeared in the midst of a solemn silence. "'Knowest thou this writing?' demanded the cadi. "'It is mine.' "'And the seal?' "'It is that of my master, Ali Pasha.' How does it come to be placed at the foot of these letters? I did this by order of my chief, abusing the confidence of my master, who occasionally allowed me to use it to sign his orders. It is enough. Thou canst withdraw. Uneasy as to the success of this intrigue, Ali was approaching the Hall of Justice. As he entered the court, the Greek, who had just finished his examination, threw himself at his feet, assuring him that all had gone well. It is good, said Ali. Thou shalt have thy reward. Turning round, he made a sign to his guards, who had their orders and who instantly seized the unhappy Greek, and drowning his voice with their shouts, hung him in the courtyard. This execution finished, the pasha presented himself before the judges and inquired the result of their investigation. He was answered by a burst of congratulation. Well, said he, the guilty author of this plot aimed at me is no more. I ordered him to be hung, without waiting to hear your decision. May all enemies of our glorious sultan perish, even as he. A report of what had occurred was immediately drawn up, and to assist matters still further, Ali sent the Kapiji Bachi a gift of fifty purses, which he accepted without difficulty, and also secured the favor of the divan by considerable presents. The sultan, yielding to the advice of his counselors, appeared to have again received him into favor. But Ali knew well that this appearance of sunshine was entirely deceptive, and that Selim only professed to believe in his innocence until the day should arrive when the sultan could safely punish his treason. He sought, therefore, to compass the latter's downfall, and made common cause with his enemies, both internal and external. A conspiracy hatched between the discontented pashas and the English agents shortly broke out, and one day, when Ali was presiding at the artillery practice of some French gunners sent to Albania by the governor of Illyria, a Tartar brought him news of the deposition of Selim, who was succeeded by his nephew Mustafa. Ali sprang up in delight and publicly thanked Allah for this great good fortune. He really did profit by this change of rulers, but he profited yet more by a second revolution which caused the deaths both of Selim, who the promoters wished to re-establish on the throne, and of Mustafa, whose downfall they intended. Mahmud II, who was next invested with the scimitar of Othman, came to the throne in troublous times, after much bloodshed, in the midst of great political upheavals, and had neither the will nor the power to attack one of his most powerful vassals. He received with evident satisfaction the million piastres which, at his installation, Ali hastened to send as a proof of his devotion, assured the pasha of his favor, and confirmed both him and his sons in their offices and dignities. 
This fortunate change in his position brought Ali's pride and audacity to a climax. Free from pressing anxiety, he determined to carry out a project which had been the dream of his life. End of chapter 4 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 5 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1 Ali Pasha by Alexander Dumas Translated by George Burnham Ives This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Chapter 5 After taking possession of our hero Castron, which he had long coveted, Ali led his victorious armies against the town of Kirdiki, whose inhabitants had formerly joined with those of Kormovo in the outrage inflicted on his mother and sister. The besieged, knowing they had no mercy to hope for, defended themselves bravely but were obliged to yield to famine. After a month's blockade, the common people, having no food for themselves or their cattle, began to cry for mercy in the open streets, and their chiefs, intimidated by the general misery and unable to stand alone, consented to capitulate. Ali, whose intentions as to the fate of this unhappy town were irrevocably decided, agreed to all that they had asked. A treaty was signed by both parties and solemnly sworn to on the Koran, in virtue of which seventy-two bays, heads of the principal Albanian families, were to go to Yanina as free men and fully armed. They were to be received with the honors due to their rank as free tenants of the sultan, their lives and their families were to be spared and also their possessions. The other inhabitants of Kardiki, being Mohammedans and therefore brothers of Ali, were to be treated as friends and retain their lives and property. On these conditions a quarter of the town was to be occupied by the victorious troops. One of the principal chiefs, Salah Bey, and his wife, foreseeing the fate which awaited their friends, committed suicide at the moment when, in pursuance of the treaty, Ali's soldiers took possession of the quarter assigned to them. Ali received the seventy-two bays with all marks of friendship when they arrived at Yanina. He lodged them in a palace on the lake and treated them magnificently for some days. But soon, having contrived on some pretext to disarm them, he had them conveyed, loaded with chains, to a Greek convent on an island in the lake, which was converted into a prison. The day of vengeance not having fully arrived, he explained this breach of faith by declaring that the hostages had attempted to escape. The popular credulity was satisfied by this explanation, and no one doubted the good faith of the pasha when he announced that he was going to Kardiki to establish a police and fulfill the promises he had made to the inhabitants. Even the number of soldiers he took excited no surprise, as Ali was accustomed to travel with a very numerous suite. After three days' journey, he stopped at Libokovo, where his sister had resided since the death of Aden Bey, her second son, cut off recently by sickness. What passed in the long interview they had, no one knew, but it was observed that Kianitsa's tears, which till then had flowed incessantly, stopped as if by magic, and her women, who were wearing mourning, received in order to attire themselves as for a festival. Feasting and dancing, begun in Ali's honor, did not cease after his departure. He spent the night at Kenderia, a castle built on a rock whence the town of Kardiki was plainly visible. Next day at daybreak, Ali dispatched an usher to summon all the male inhabitants of Kardiki to appear before Shenderia, in order to receive assurances of the pasha's pardon and friendship. The Kardikiotes at once divined that this injunction was the precursor of a terrible vengeance. The whole town echoed with cries and groans, and the mosques were filled with people praying for deliverance. The appointed time arrived. They embraced each other as if parting forever, and then the men, unarmed, in number six hundred and seventy, started for Chenderia. At the gate of the town they encountered a troop of Albanians, who followed as if to escort them, and which increased in number as they proceeded. Soon they arrived in the dread presence of Ali Pasha. Grouped in formidable masses around him stood several thousand of his fierce soldiery. The unhappy Kardikiotes realized their utter helplessness, and saw that they, their wives and children, were completely at the mercy of their implacable enemy. They fell prostrate before the pasha, and with all the fervor which the utmost terror could inspire, implored him to grant them a generous pardon. Ali for some time silently enjoyed the pleasure of seeing his ancient enemies lying before him prostrate in the dust. He then desired them to rise, reassured them, 
called them brothers sons friends of his heart distinguishing some of his old acquaintances he called them to him spoke familiarly of the days of their youth of their games their early friendships and pointing to the young men said with tears in his eyes the discord which has divided us for so many years has allowed children not born at the time of our dissension to grow into men i have lost the pleasure of watching the development of the offspring of my neighbors and the early friends of my youth and of bestowing benefits on them but i hope shortly to repair the natural results of our melancholy divisions he then made them splendid promises and ordered them to assemble in a neighboring caravanserai where he wished to give them a banquet in proof of reconciliation passing from the depths of despair to transports of joy the cardikiotes repaired gaily to the caravanserai heaping blessings on the pasha and blaming each other for having ever doubted his good faith ali was carried down from chanderia in a litter attended by his courtiers who celebrated his clemency in pompous speeches to which he replied with gracious smiles at the foot of the steep descent he mounted his horse and followed by his troops rode towards the caravanserai alone and in silence he rode twice around it then returning to the gate which had just been closed by his order he pulled up his horse and signing to his own bodyguard to attack the building slay them he cried in a voice of thunder the guards remained motionless in surprise and horror then as the pasha with a roar repeated his order they indignantly flung down their arms in vain he harangued flattered or threatened them some preserved a sullen silence others ventured to demand mercy then he ordered them away and calling on the christian murdites who served under his banner to you brave latins he cried i will now entrust the duty of exterminating the foes of my race avenge me and i will reward you magnificently a confused murmur rose from the ranks ali imagined they were consulting as to what recompense should be required as the price of such deed speak said he i am ready to listen to your demands and to satisfy them then the murdite leader came forward and threw back the hood of his black cloak o oh, pasha said he looking ali boldly in the face thy words are an insult the merdites do not slaughter unarmed prisoners in cold blood release the cardikiotes give them arms and we will fight them to the death but we serve thee as soldiers and not as executioners at these words which the black cloaked battalion received with applause ali thought himself betrayed and looked around with doubt and mistrust fear was nearly taking the place of mercy words of pardon were on his lips when a certain athanasius vaya a greek schismatic and a favorite of the pasha's whose illegitimate son he was supposed to be advanced at the head of the scum of the army and offered to carry out the death sentence ali applauded his zeal gave him full authority to act and spurred his horse to the top of a neighboring hill the better to enjoy the spectacle uh, the christian murdites and the mohammedan guards knelt together to pray for the miserable cardikiotes whose last hour had come the caravanserai where they were shut in was a square enclosure open to the sky and intended to shelter herds of buffaloes the prisoners having heard nothing of what passed outside were astonished to behold athanasius vaya and his troops appearing on the top of the wall they did not long remain in doubt ali gave the signal by a pistol shot and a general fusillade followed terrible cries echoed from the court the prisoners terrified wounded crowded one upon another for shelter some ran frantically hither and thither in this enclosure with no shelter and no exit until they fell struck down by bullets some tried to climb the walls in hope of either escape or vengeance only to be flung back by either scimitars or muskets it was a terrible scene of despair and death after an hour of firing a gloomy silence descended on the place now occupied solely by a heap of corpses ali forbade any burial rites on pain of death and placed over the gate an inscription in letters of gold informing posterity that six hundred cardikiotes had there been sacrificed to the memory of his mother campco when the shrieks of death ceased in the enclosure they began to be heard in the town 
the assassins spread themselves through it and having violated the women and children gathered them into a crowd to be driven to libokovo at every halt in this frightful journey fresh marauders fell on the wretched victims claiming their share in cruelty and debauchery at length they arrived at their destination where the triumphant and implacable kianitsa awaited them as after the taking of Kormovo, she compelled the women to cut off their hair and to stuff with it a mattress on which she lay. She then stripped them and joyfully narrated to them the massacre of their husbands, fathers, brothers, and sons, and when she had sufficiently enjoyed their misery, they were again handed over to the insults of the soldiery. Kenitsa finally published an edict forbidding either clothes, shelter, or food to be given to the women and children of Kardiki, who were then driven forth into the woods either to die of hunger or to be devoured by wild beasts. As to the seventy-two hostages, Ali put them all to death when he returned to Yanina. His vengeance was indeed complete. But as, filled with a horrible satisfaction, the pasha was enjoying the repose of a satiated tiger, an indignant and threatening voice reached him even in the recesses of his palace. The Sheikh Yusuf, governor of the castle of yanina venerated as a saint by the mohammedans on account of his piety and universally beloved and respected for his many virtues entered ali's sumptuous dwelling for the first time the guards on beholding him remained stupefied and motionless then the most devout prostrated themselves while others went to inform the pasha but no one dared hinder the venerable man who walked calmly and solemnly through the astonished attendants for him there existed no antechamber, no delay. Disdaining the ordinary forms of etiquette, he paced slowly through the various apartments, until, with no usher to announce him, he reached that of Ali. The latter, whose impiety by no means saved him from superstitious terrors, rose hastily from the divan and advanced to meet the holy sheik, who was followed by a crowd of silent courtiers. Ali addressed him with the utmost respect, and endeavored even to kiss his right hand. Yusuf hastily withdrew it, covered it with his mantle, and signed to the pasha to seat himself. Ali mechanically obeyed, and waited in solemn silence to hear the reason of this unexpected visit. Yusuf desired him to listen with all attention, and then reproached him for his injustice and rapine, his treachery and cruelty, with such vivid eloquence that his hearers dissolved in tears. Ali, though much dejected, alone preserved his equanimity, until at length the sheik accused him of having caused the death of Emina. He then grew pale, and rising, cried with terror, Alas, my father, whose name do you now pronounce? Pray for me, or at least do not sink me to Gehenna with your curses. There is no need to curse thee, answered Yusuf. Thine own crimes bear witness against thee. Allah has heard their cry. He will summon thee judge thee and punish thee eternally tremble for the time is at hand thine hour is coming is coming is coming and casting a terrible glance at the pasha the holy man turned his back on him and stalked out of the apartment without another word ali in terror demanded a thousand pieces of gold put them in a white satin purse and hastened himself with them to overtake the sheik imploring him to recall his threats but Yusuf deigned no answer, and arrived at the threshold of the palace, shook off the dust of his feet against it. Ali returned to his apartment sad and downcast, and many days elapsed before he could shake off the depression caused by this scene. But soon he felt more ashamed of his inaction than of the reproaches which had caused it, and on the first opportunity resumed his usual mode of life. The occasion was the marriage of Mustai, Pasha of Skodra, with the eldest daughter of Veli Pasha, called the Princess of Aulis, because she had for dowry whole villages in that district. Immediately after the announcement of this marriage, Ali set on foot a sort of Saturnalia, about the details of which there seemed to be as much mystery as if he had been preparing an assassination. All at once, as if by a sudden inundation, the very scum of the earth appeared to spread over Yanina, the populace, as if trying to drown their misery, plunged into a drunkenness which simulated pleasure. Disorderly bands of mountebanks from the depths of Rumelia traversed the streets, the bazaars, and public places. Flocks and herds with fleeces dyed scarlet and gilded horns were seen on all the roads driven to the court by peasants under the guidance of their priests. 
bishops abbots ecclesiastics generally were compelled to drink and to take part in ridiculous and indecent dances ali apparently thinking to raise himself by degrading his more respectable subjects day and night these spectacles succeeded each other with increasing rapidity the air resounded with firing songs cries music and the roaring of wild beasts in shows enormous spits loaded with meat smoked before huge braziers and wine ran in floods at tables prepared in the palace courts troops of brutal soldiers drove workmen from their labor with whips and compelled them to join in the entertainments dirty and impudent jugglers invaded private houses and pretending that they had orders from the pasha to display their skill carried boldly off whatever they could lay their hands upon ali saw the general demoralization with pleasure especially as it tended to the gratification of his avarice every guest was expected to bring to the palace gate a gift in proportion to his means and foot officers watched to see that no one forgot this obligation at length on the nineteenth day ali resolved to crown the feast by an orgy worthy of himself he caused the galleries and halls of his castle by the lake to be decorated with unheard-of splendor and fifteen hundred guests assembled for a solemn banquet the pasha appeared in all his glory surrounded by his noble attendants and courtiers and seating himself on a dais raised above this base crowd which trembled at his glance gave the signal to begin at his voice vice plunged into its most shameless diversions and the wine-steeped wings of debauchery outspread themselves over the feast all tongues were at their freest all imaginations ran wild all evil passions were at their height when suddenly the noise ceased and the guests clung together in terror a man stood at the entrance of the hall pale disordered and wild-eyed clothed in torn and blood-stained garments as everyone made way at his approach he easily reached the pasha and prostrating himself at his feet presented a letter ali opened and rapidly perused it his lips trembled his eyebrows met in a terrible frown the muscles of his forehead contracted alarmingly his vainly endeavored to smile and to look as if nothing had happened his agitation betrayed him and he was obliged to retire after desiring a herald to announce that he wished the banquet to continue now for the subject of the message and the cause of the dismay it produced end of chapter five recording by john van stan savannah georgia